joining the Association of Master Herbalists for our talk with Marcus Patchett. He is a master herbalist and also an expert on cacao and we will be talking to him all about cacao and how it can be used in ritual, tradition and medicine. So we are just starting now where Marcus is telling us all about how he got into herbal medicine and cacao in the first place. We hope you enjoy. Repairing the damage of other substances, let's say. And um, but then like that rabbit hole just led on to many other rabbit holes, you know. So once I started buying and, and using plants, I realized that a lot of the plants, because when I'd grown up, my mum had a little herb garden that I never really used to pay any attention to. My granddad was a chemist who worked for Glaxo, but he was actually kind of a country herbalist. When I was little, we used to, I used to make, help him make herbal wines, like dandelion wine and whatever. I used to find really boring as a kid. But all of that stuff was sort of in my family on the on the quiet. So um, I suddenly started realizing, oh, I, I, this my mum used to grow this in her garden, and my, my granddad used to have this in his garden and whatever. So anyway, um, that's that's where that interest came about. And then when I finished my art degree, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I didn't know that I I knew that I didn't want to be an artist because it sounded um, it sounded like it would be very hard work. Uh, promoting yourself constantly oh the irony being a self-employed herbalist I think we can all probably relate to that but um, I, I was I was advised by all my friends to study herbal medicine because they were like if you don't study it we'll, we'll you know they, they, they essentially threatened me because they said I wouldn't shut up about it so they just said study that you know that's the thing you want to do so anyway, that's what I wanted it and the chocolate thing came about because I'd always had an interest in it and I write about this in the introduction to the book when I was um, when I was in my sort of slightly hedonistic clubbing days, my post clubbing meal would always be on a Sunday night after having been out for 24 hours or 48 hours or possibly slightly longer than that would be um, bananas with melted dark chocolate on it. I always used to crave that. Um, so I've always liked dark chocolate. And then I read a little book by the ethnobotanist Jonathan Ott, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, he's, if, if not, look up his work. It's, it's um, very good. He's very pharmacologically, uh, he's very pharmacophilic. He likes to reduce things to just substances, but he's also quite good at writing. Uh, I, I mean, he's quite dry, but I quite like the technical detail in his work. Anyway, he wrote a very short book in the 80s uh, highly yeah, just as you logged on uh, he wrote a very short book in the 80s uh, called chocolate addict which um i really liked um because he was such a chocolate enthusiast um and that really sparked my interest in it because in that book he was saying how the mexica used to use cacao with uh psilocybin mushrooms they used to consume them with those mushrooms in ritual um, but he sort of wrote all the effects of cacao off to theobromine he sort of said it's all just a stimulant it's like theobromine and the reputation as an aphrodisiac it's just down to theobromine stimulating the heart a little bit the beta beta adrenal receptors theobromine that's all it is and I just instinctively was like no that can't be right because it's it's got such a qualitative it's so qualitatively different and all the different vehicles of caffeine like tea, coffee, uh, cacao, guarana, yerba mate, all those different plants, they are all qualitatively different. So it's this kind of old Victorian hangover pharmacophilic mentality that we're all familiar with as herbalists or as herbalist adjacent people that um, everything is reducible to one simple substance, uh, which is is blatantly patently not true there's sufficient research there's an ocean of research now demonstrating the existence of synergy in plants and that plants and anyway so that that i'd already I, I was already interested enough in plants and involved enough in plants to sort of know a bit about that the first plant i bought from a chinese herbalist years ago was was ginseng and uh, i immediately bought this book by stephen Fulder called the book of ginseng which some of you will know which is a really good book about adaptogens the sort of predecessor of the hoffman book on adaptogens or whatever really written in 1992 or something brilliant book just ex on exposition on how they function and how they restore the body to homeostasis and i also sent off to the encyclopedia britannica this is back in the dark ages before the internet so 1998 or whatever uh, for a bunch of fact sheets about um, ginseng and 
it was an extraordinary phrase in one of these fact sheets where it said um, something, I think it was like that uh, some research indicates that ginseng may re restore the body to homeostasis. However, others believe it is a placebo. And I was like, well, one of those statements is true. Um, so, and I ingested it in lots and lots and lots of different ways, uh, some of them not recommended, and established to my satisfaction that it did in fact do things. Um, and so that was how I started got, getting interested in herbal medicine. So when I read Jonathan Ock's book about theobroma, I was like, well, no, I don't agree with that. So anyway, when I, when I finished with the, with the herbal medicine degree, I already had it in my mind to write a book about chocolate. Um, and the second inspiration for it was just that I wanted to, I'd read a bit about the old pre-Columbian drinks made with cacao and how originally it was drunk rather as coffee is drunk and they had all these different formulations which Jonathan Ott talked about he mentioned in his book um, so I, I, I was like as a herbalist as somebody interested in herbs by that point I was studying herbal medicine um, I wanted to look into that and try and find out more about the ancient forms of cacao and how it was used for the 2000 or 3000 years of its history before it was imported to Europe in the 1530s or whatever because all of the books about chocolate that some of them some of them there are a few a handful of books now that are really excellent and go into that pre-columbian stuff but back then most of the books with the one exception of Sophie and Michael Coe's book on chocolate um, really focused on chocolate as candy, as as and, and and that sort of thing. So anyway, I'm I'm tangenting a bit, Izzy. Yeah. So just um... See, this is so, so interesting, and actually, just um, carrying on from your point around how it was used, um, you know, pre 1500. Um, could you talk about yeah how it would have been traditionally used versus how we are using it today, and just share with us sort of the story behind you know how we've come all this way to cacao ceremonies versus like what, <laughs> what people do oh, right that's kind of a a very long one all right so <laughs> stop, stop me at, at any point because um okay, I think what's the best way to answer that one okay tr so traditionally in in Mesa America, from what we can gather. Chocolate was extremely important and still is somewhat, uh, it still retains some, something of that in, in traditional cultures. But like most traditional items and cultural sort of things worldwide, it's sort of, it's fading gradually. So I, I interviewed a couple of people in the book. There was one um, uh, day keeper, which is the Mayan name for the sort of, uh, the Mayan sort of shaman in a way, but not really it's sort of like religious the version, Mayan version of a priest in the traditional religion, but they, they're the ones who do divination and people come to for answers about things. Um, some of them are, are curanderos, as in their healers, some of them aren't. The day keepers, though, are the keepers of the religious festivals and of the calendar, which is a divinatory system as well as a ritual calendar. Um, anyway, I digress. The point is I interviewed this guy and he was recounting how in his youth, um, Every, on every important festival, the, the women of the village would get up at five in the morning and start roasting the cacao beans so that when the rest of the village woke up, the whole village would smell of cacao and then they would be serving these big foaming cacao drinks. Um, and that nowadays, he said, uh, everyone just drinks Pepsi and the cacao is not available. And what's, re what's really sad about that story is about a year, this, I interviewed him in 2011, 2011. And about three years later, I got a message from my contact in, in that village, uh, a lady called Veronica, social worker, who was brilliant. She knew everyone, very helpful. But she contacted me to say he developed type 2 diabetes, which is just an epidemic in Mexico, as, as in America in general. And the, the volume of soft drinks and the amount of sugar they add to the food and lots of factors there. But um, the point was that, like many things, it, it was, it was, it's fading, but it was absolutely essential integral to the culture and it was used both secularly and ritually now we don't know all the details about the ritual use of it i put what i know in the book from reading mainly that that part of the book which is the third section of the book about the metaphysics and the mythology and that sort of aspect of cacao's history is mainly secondary sources i've got some primary sources like my interviews with people um like him but um uh, 
Don Matteo, I think his name was. Uh, I've got him named in the book. But I've got a few primary sources, but it's mainly secondary sources, because the, the bulk of the book is about the pharmacology and about it, the recipes. So that's lots of primary source stuff. Um, but from what we do know, it was used ritually uh, as mostly a sort of benign substance to attract good. That's It's still used in Qurandarisma there in rituals to attract good. And it was often given as an offering. And it was one of a few naturally occurring substances which was seen as a repository of, for want of, I know, in, in English, it would sort of like be a magic power. <laughs> uh, it would, it's it, in Mayan, I mean, when I say Mayan, I just want to qualify this by saying that the Maya are in fact a whole diaspora of peoples. There are there 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 is not one homogenous Mayan people. There are many different Mayan peoples, and they're like in Guatemala today. There are forty six different indigenous languages spoken, or whatever. So the Maya that we when we say the Maya historically it's just the people, the various peoples who inhabited that part of the world, and who spoke different languages and had some different beliefs, but they had some beliefs in common. And one of the Maya words, I don't know which Maya language it is for, for this sort of magic powers, was its, uh, I-T-Z, and their, their creator shaman god was called Itzamna. And the idea was that you would, in, in, in a ritual, you would draw down soul stuff from the sky. They called that chulel, and it was envisioned as clouds. And then that would sort of be drawn down into into the body in, in a ritual and used to make things happen in the world. That was the purpose of ritual. It was very shamanic. It was, you know, it was a formalized shamanism in a way. So that's why they were big into sacrifice because it was always like you paid for it. You know, you paid for it with, you, you gave either an offering of jade or something precious or the most precious thing was, was blood because that contained life. So most of the, uh, they weren't quite as gory as people think. They weren't sacrificing people you know, willy nilly, but that's the, the, the apex of that was human sacrifice. That dark part of their history does exist. But I'll talk about that in a second because, um, anyway, that's a that's a tangent I'll come on to in a second. But the the point about the about cacao was because cacao made from the toasted or roasted seeds of chocolate was or cacao that the tree theobroma cacao. You basically get the seeds, you ferment them although traditionally we're not sure how much they fermented them. That's in question. It's probably variable in different parts of the country, but they were fermented and then toasted or roasted and uh, then ground. And they were ground to a liquid. And once they're thoroughly ground enough, they liquefy because of the percentage of the fat in the bean, 50% fat or more. It's around 50% fat. Um, so they liquefy because all the, all the solid little particles end up um, in, a, in sort of... In, covered in this layer of fat from the bean um and can somebody switch their microphone off please it's quite distracting thank you um so yeah so anyway you end up with this liquid which of course as we all know with chocolate one of its characteristic properties is that it it sets at room temperature so certain natural substances like uh, blood tree resin um i think uh, semen and chocolate and i'm missing one uh what, what, that there were these natural substances which congealed and they were all thought to be repositories of this it of this of this magic power um because they were living substances or seen as living anyway from of living origin which would change state so i kind of like metaphorically it's like um I mean, metaphorically, is such a Western concept. They wouldn't have thought about this as a meta. That's a very Western academic way of thinking about it. But they'd have thought about it in, in terms of congealing the the, the property, you know, the properties being being set in in the physical realm, if you like. Um, so anyway, there's there's fairly strong evidence that they they thought of cacao in that way, and it was given as an offering, but also consumed. Uh, in rituals and it was also drunk at weddings and celebrations and funerals all these major threshold ceremonies um, and given as a gift and it was always seen as something uh, something benign and life-giving and one of the things I think is most revealing is the Mexica the, the Aztec one of their names for chocolate and this is from Sophie and Michael Coe's book um, on on chocolate which is a really useful resource for, for this kind of stuff, um, was, uh, I think, 
it, it translated to oh, what was it it's um the heart the blood um i can't remember the 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 mashika name for it now it was yolol estli that was it yolol meaning the heart and estli meaning blood yolol estli um the heart the blood and their name for the vital force which like every traditional culture worldwide or most of them they thought resided in the heart uh they called yolol istli so their name for cacao is like a pun on the life force that resided in the heart which is really interesting given the the plethora of pharmacological research information we have now about the effects of cacao on uh, it's a, having a protective effect on vascular endothelium and reducing the risk of heart attack and stroke quite substantially. So, and just, anyway. Oh, so I just had um, a question whether, I don't know whether this is possible, the light in your background is making you a bit fuzzy. Is there a way to <laughs> um, That's probably darker. Is that better? Um, I, I, uh, let's just check. Do, do people prefer it on or, or off? I think I'm me... agnostic. Okay, better. Okay, people think. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and just to um, everyone that has joined, um, please, if you have any questions, um, if you want to share them in the chat, and I will sort of come on to them. So that's um, fascinating sort of history of, um, yeah, the traditional uses of cacao. How would you think it compares to how we're using it today? <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, there's, there's, that's the tip of a very large iceberg because I haven't even got into the medicinal uses of it yet. You know, I mean, I we just hear about that. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the 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 medicinal uses. We know that nowadays, um, I'll talk about the contemporary medicinal use of cacao in Mexico uh, and Guatemala and Central America. Then I'll talk a little bit about what we know about how it may have been used traditionally, which is not much. Although I, I mentioned that in the book, I go into detail about that in the book. And then I'll talk about comparing to how we use it today, I guess, because that would be, does yeah. that make sense? Right. So the, the, in, in contemporary Mexico, it's cacao seeds, uh, chocolate, um, it's used in a few different ways. The most common way is um, it's, it's recommended by midwives to, as a galactagogue to improve breast milk production. Um, and that makes sense for a number of different reasons, which I go into in the book. The, the pharmacology of it contains small amounts of this alkaloid called salsolinol, which um, has a pretty complex effect. It, it, it essentially um, increases dopamine release or something. It affects dopamine release, which we know modulates prolactin, you know, which is one of the hormones that, that increases breast milk production but it only has that effect in the presence of endorphins and endorphins are released when a breastfeeding or when a mother is breastfeeding a baby. So because of the pain, because <laughs> it's uncomfortable. So that causes the release of endorphins and because of the closeness, the physical closeness. So that then triggers the salsolinol in the cacao to have uh, increase the prolactin release, uh, I think. And that makes sense because cacao is used in this way. Cocoa powder is added to mare's food and has been for years in veterinary medicine to increase, increase lactation. So I think that's the, the, the possible mechanics of it. So that's one of the common uses. And it also makes sense because it's a storable dried food. So in, in really poor countries like Guatemala, the two foods that you can absolutely, vegetable foods that you can store are maize, a staple food, and, um, and, and cacao. They don't they don't go off if you keep them well. Um, and, you know, when, so when fresh food might not be available, or people might not be able to afford much, that they're always available. Other uses um, in contemporary medicine, it's used as a vehicle for lots of other herbs because it disguises the flavor well. And cacao is also considered to have a few like properties that we know about and some that might be surprising. So uh, stimulant anti-fatigue, obvious slightly stimulating uh, it's used as a sort of tonic and aerobrant to help recovery from disease and chronic diseases particularly chronic lung ailments although in some parts of the country or in the countries i should say in central america that it's con it's considered to be contraindicated for lung ailments it was quite interesting there were really contrasting views and i go into that in the book because I, I think there's a rationale from both sides depending on the use um, but generally as a sort of tonic restorative remedy um, to, to improve health. 
Um, it's also used as a sort of anti-diarrheal and again mainly in, in recovery from dysentery um, which makes sense because there's a, bit, a good bit of research about cacao's beneficial effect on the microbiome. Uh, there's some good human research there, clinical double blind uh, stuff showing changes in the microbiome after a month's consumption of, of dark chocolate. Um, the other uses, the ones that's quite surprising and I found really interesting was a preventative use for snake bite or envenomation. Now I wouldn't rely on that obviously but it, it's an interesting one because um, it had that reputation among the Maya, it seems to be a very old traditional reputation and you know that in Central America, some of the most venomous snakes in the world. It's got like the Ferdelands, I um, can't remember if it's got Copperhead, but it's got a couple of other ones anyway. And snake venom is highly variable and very complex. But one of the ways I think it might work is that we know that a lot of snake venoms contain hyaluronidases, which are enzymes which break down connective tissue and help the spread of the poison throughout the, the, the body. And some of the polyphenols in cacao, I think, um, inhibit hyaluronidases. I mean, I go into the specifics in, 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 in the book. There's a little section on that and, and in the appendix as well. But um, So that's very interesting. So, I mean, as I say, I wouldn't rely on it. But the interesting thing is that if, if all the nobles and, and the uh, elite of Mesoamerica were drinking chocolate all the time, one wonders if they'd noticed that effect, say they went into the jungle, somebody got bitten, um, and whereas, you know, their, their, one of their vassals may have died, maybe they survived, you know, something like that. So I, I don't know, because the, the serpents were very, very venerated in Mesa America, because they were probably quite rightly seen as the gateway between life and death, but for, for obvious reasons, given, given the, their, their um, you know, their yeah. dangerousness. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so and then so that's a bit about the traditional uses. Um, other traditional uses they were used in, in some pre Columbian prescriptions, which were kind of shamanic. They were very like, um, very analogous to many old world prescriptions, in fact, particularly those from um, sort of Celtic times or whatever, because they had a heavy magical component and symbolic component symbolic in, in western terms and um they but they also had this sort of humoral component i mean it wasn't humoral medicine because they didn't have galenism but they had the hot cold polarity that's very uh true of many indigenous cultures so they recognize these sort of four states of, of hot cold damp and dry which is really interesting very like the aristotelian um you know pre-humoral system uh, but they're principally focusing on the hot and cold so they classified medicines into hot and cold and and wet and dry um so but and they also had this heavy magical thing so there's a lot of commonalities but a lot of their medicines incorporating cacao were complex formulae with sort of magical intent so it's it's difficult from a modern sort of slightly pharmacologically trained mindset to to pick apart the influence of cacao but it does seem looking at them that some of the commonalities seem to be um again this theme of restore restorative or having a restorative effect um and there's some interesting formulae for getting rid of fear and for um protecting against insanity but those are magical formulae so it's difficult to know how much yeah. to, to read into it um so then then we've got um the modern use of cacao, which it's not really being used as a medicine. When it was brought over to Europe, of course, it was initially a medicine, like tobacco was, and then it was kind of um, became a fashionable drug, and then it was, you know, became chocolate. So that's sort of the, the very condensed timeline. Um, but initially it was touted as this sort of aphrodisiac, which funnily enough wasn't really a use to which it was put in Mesoamerica. Now, in, in a sense, in, in a tangential way it was, because it was used as a fortifying medicine. But I think this comes from the account of one of the conquistadors, the anonymous conqueror, who you should, if, if, non, if you haven't heard of his book, you should get it. It's, um, if I just grab it off the shelf, I think I've got it up here. Um, I can find it. I don't know if I can find it. 
I can't, I can't, typically I can't see it right now, but it's a book called by the Anonymous Conqueror and it's, it's an account of the conquest of, of New Spain, as they called it then, Mexico. And what's fantastic about it is it is written by one of the conquistadors in his old age, like when he was old age, but when he was in his 70s or whatever, quite old for the time, um, he wrote his memoirs. So it's his actual memoir the first hand account of the conquest of mexico and it's fascinating it sort of gives you the spanish eye view of going into this country and sort of completely alien uh, it's, it's kind of kind of incomprehensible it's as if we went to another planet in our solar system a little bunch of us got there all sick and starving and discovered this vast alien race and uh, they welcomed us with gifts, and then we decided. But we'd already decided we wanted we wanted to conquer that territory because we knew there was something we wanted there. It's, but anyway, it's it's a fascinating book, and I, I suggest you read it. But the point is about that he described the Mexica Emperor Moctezuma or Montezuma, as he's been renamed, as drinking fifty cups of having 50 cups of chocolate made for him every day and then and being surrounded by beautiful women or, or drinking them before he went to bed his women or something so it's his account i think it's that early bit of pr which was responsible for the reputation of cacao as an aphrodisiac in europe and sort of led to that branding i think um and and a lot of very conscious um uh, advertising by well-heeled physicians in Europe at the time with their sort of exotic exotic new world nostrums um, but it's, it's quite interesting that the that the two of the vegetable drugs that arrived in Europe uh, I sort of make a, 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 a tangential comment about this in the book you've got cacao which was seen as this aphrodisiac and then sarsaparilla which was seen as this remedy for syphilis, which of course was the other import from the New World. We think, historians aren't sure, but they think it came over from New World, which is only fair because the common cold, which we took over there, decimated the indigenous population. The common cold literally killed, and smallpox uh, literally killed 90% of the indigenous population within something like 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we brought syphilis back. Um, and uh, it's just ironic to my mind that the two really famous vegetable drugs, well, two of them were, were cacao, which was this venereal drug, then syphilis, which was this antidote, which anyway. So I'm just, I'm just conscious that we're halfway through, so I'll try and get to um, everyone's questions. And <laughs> I, I, think... do, I do go on, cut, cut me off, Izzy, if I'm, if I'm, you know, you want me to get It's just so them. interesting there, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, good, I suppose. <laughs> so just, I think just linking it, um, Alicia sent in a, a question before anyway about how you would use um, cacao in practice as a herbalist. So I guess bringing it back to sort of, yet yeah, today's use of cacao, how would you specifically use it, I don't know, with clients or with yourself? Right, okay, oh well, with, with myself, I think that's probably more in the way of a sort of addiction more than anything, but um, with, with clients, um, I don't use it all that often, but I do use it, I use it, I don't know, maybe five to 10% of my clients, I use it. So um, I've got one uh, client now who has had long COVID, you know, just recovering from that. Um, so as part of her regime, I've just got her on 20 grams of 85% ordinary dark chocolate a day. And that's not because that's the best form. It's just because it's accessible and it tastes nice and patients are likely to comply with it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's one way. Another way that, uh, so it's, it's very useful because, because with the, with the post COVID syndrome, as I'm sure many of you know, it's, um, I think the virus actually binds to um oh what's it called the receptors for that thing associated with blood pressure my brain's just um oh dearie me the um what are those drugs used to treat blood pressure my brain's just gone blank um diuretics yeah no they've got diuretics calcium channel blockers and then what are the what's the other um and beta blockers 
Angiotensin. The other one, the angiotensin conversing enzyme. That one. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Angi thank you. Well done. Brilliant. Thank you, Izzy. Yeah. The, angi the angiotensin uh, ACE. The ACE receptors. They think they think uh, something uh, COVID in, in, gets into cells via the ACE receptors. And anyway, we know that it causes all kinds of problems with the vascular endothelium. And cacao is absolutely fantastic for the vascular endothelium. Uh, like in common with many other plants containing polyphenols, it increases nitric oxide release in, in, and manufacture in, in, in the vascular endothelium, so it helps vasodilation. But there's a bunch of different uh, compounds in cacao that actually assist vasodilation and protect the endothelium and whatnot. So it's, it's really good just for that kind of circulatory system protection. Uh, plus it tastes nice um, and it was used traditionally as a tonic. So that's one method. The other, the other application I've used it for is um, chronic fatigue. There's a very small clinical trial, um, very, very small, only 10 patients, but it's, it was gold standard, like double blind placebo controlled, randomized, yada, yada. Um, I think it was a crossover design, but anyway, they just gave a bunch of, I hope I'm telling you the truth there. I've got it in the book, but it's, it's, they, they gave a bunch, I know it's about nine or 10 people, and they gave these people, um, a dose of chocolate. I don't think it was huge for a, f a, a few months. And they found that with the chronic fatigue patients, uh, there was a significant improvement in both their mood and their physical symptoms like pain and fatigue. And I found that pretty remarkable because as, as I'm sure many of you know, chronic fatigue is not an easy thing to treat. For, for multiple reasons, I think it's pretty, it can be quite intractable. I've had a couple of successes with it, but particularly when it's entrenched, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to get into. So that I've, I've, I've certainly found beneficial. I've recommended to a couple of clients with chronic fatigue um, at a dosage of, depending on their sensitivity. So one was a client who could barely eat anything, M multiple food intolerances, um, couldn't get on with anything. So I said, just start with five grams of dark chocolate a day. And she immediately noticed after about two weeks that her stool was firmer and her digestion felt stronger. So I was like, well, just up it then a bit. And so she ended up having 40 grams a day. I was like, that's too much. That's too much. You need to get it down about 20, 20 a day is fine. So, uh, cause I was like, you know, the thing is it is a stimulant. So if you go too far, it'll start taking out of the bank rather than putting in. So I was like, just get it down to around 20 a day. Um, but she did very well on that. It just improved uh, her fatigue a bit and it certainly improved her guts like nothing else had okay. after she's a long-term client. She, she was my client for around 10 years. Um, another um, application was for a chap who'd had um, a prostate biopsy and following the biopsy, he's in his 70s because um, his PSA was up. So they had to do an investigative biopsy. Um, he got erectile dysfunction and couldn't get erections anymore, which is kind of distressing because he was in a relationship. So um, I, I used chocolate as the main treatment. And I get, this is a good, useful way of using it. There's a, a brand called Willie's Supreme Cacao. I mean, it's kind of ironic, but whatever, we won't mention that. Um, <laughs> where, where you just grate the blocks of it. And uh, Willie's is pretty good because it's, it's just pure cacao. It's just, the, it's just the couverture. It's just the ground beans, no added fat, no added sugar. But he does make um, uh, eating chocolate with sugar and fat, but he does the cooking chocolate, which is just blocks. And it's single estate, meaning it's all from beans grown from the same place and it's high quality. Water. Anyway, point is you can grate that and then you can add your own sweetening and your own spices. So what I've done with this guy and another client who had um, chronic fatigue and depression and poor circulation was I prescribed a herbal tea, which I got them to brew up in a cafetiere and then use that tea to make the chocolate with, you know, while it's still hot to so grate the chocolate because chocolate is a brilliant flavor disguiser. I mean, there are some things, there are some sins it won't cover like wormwood. I mean, just, you know, no, but um, a lot of herbs will go surprisingly well with it. So um, in his case, I, I think I used some pretty, like, I think I used verbena and turner, like Damiana um, and, and vervain, which I think is amazing, and oat straw and some other bits and bobs in the tea. Um, and he started drinking that. But he, the interesting side note, he came at, back after a month and said, I said, oh, it's, it's, I was like, how are you going? He said, oh, well, you know, the, the, the plumbing's all working again, but I'm, I'm getting these really crazy dreams. And I was like, 
when are you drinking your chocolate? And he was like, oh, I'm drinking it at night. And I was like, no, this is really strong. If you make it from the grated beans, so drink it in the morning or at midday. Um, and I said, just have it two or three times a week now. It's fine because everything was working again. And uh, so when he came back the next time, he said, oh, that's, that's fine now. That's working okay. So um, just a side note, uh, uh, it, it, um, because of this probable action on the serotonergic system, it does sometimes have this um, technicolor dream creating effect, um, which is quite interesting. Me, I can't have it at night at all because I wouldn't sleep. Uh, I w yeah, yeah just actually, that is, um, we have got a question from Christine who does ask if there is a solution um, because, what did she say? A small amount of dark by about 11 a.m. is all I can tolerate these days. Um, yeah. is, there, is this a common problem and is there a solution for this sort of stimulant? Totally. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the, the, the first thing is, I mean, obviously, chocolate, although it is wonderful and cacao is a fantastic substance, it isn't, as, as we know, it isn't a, a panacea um, and it is a stimulant. So, I think Christine the solution you've identified is the correct one is to is to not have it after 11 a.m um if you are having a late one for whatever reason if you know you're going out for dinner in the evening then you might lash out and have a stronger dose of chocolate in the morning so because it doesn't matter because you're going to be staying up later um and also on the other side of that there's some there's good research showing that chocolate is very useful if you have pulled an all-nighter i mean i wouldn't want it in a hangover actually because the vasodilation is probably the last thing you want with a hangover because it just intensify the headache probably but if you've just had standard sleep deprivation there's a small trial in humans showing that chocolate was very effective at reducing the effects of it in terms of the performance and the speed of processing um uh, you know uh, mental processing uh, performance on on quizzes of, of a bunch of volunteers um, and that's probably because it combines the low dose of caffeine and the stimulants with this vasodilatory properly, property. They've done sort of CAT scans of human volunteers showing that the blood flow to the cortex is increased by about 20% after uh, consuming uh, an ordinary dose, say 10 to 20 grams of dark chocolate. So uh, that's probably why. But so, yeah, Christine, in answer to your, to your question, um, other than doing what the Chinese call wearing two hats, in other words, taking a sedative after your stimulant, um, which they consider suboptimal, probably doing what you're doing is the best thing and just capping your intake earlier in the day because people do have varying sensitivities. And I'm sure we all know people who can have a shot of espresso and then go to bed. I am not one of them. As you probably all noticed, I talk a million miles an hour as it is. So uh, yes, I, I have a similar issue. I have to have it early in the day. <laughs> Um, so we do have a question from Rumana, um, and then perhaps after we'll go back on to sort of the entheogen um, properties of cacao. So um, Rumana was just wondering if you had ever come across any reasons of the physiology why women would crave chocolate for their period. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I, I, that, yes, I think it boils down to, if we're going to be reductionist and pharmacological about it, I think it boils down to serotonin, or more specifically the serotonin-estrogen connection. But there are two possible answers to this. So I'll give the pharmacological one, and then I'll give the yes but. <laughs> so the pharmacological one is the serotonin thing. We know that, you know, as estrogen levels drop before the period, that the central levels of dopamine and serotonin also dip, and that causes a, a mood dip, de depending, you know, depending how precipitous the drop and on the physiology and lots of other factors. But that's essentially what happens. So the chocolate craving, pharmacologically speaking, could be explained by that, because we know that um, cacao contains, uh, is probably the polyphenols, but it's also... Uh, possibly affected some of the trace substances in cacao what I call its fairy dust constituents which I go into in the book uh, it's got all these little tiny tiny amounts of little constituents and these other constituents that prevent their breakdown so is there evidence for chocolate affecting serotonin yes there is in human volunteers they found that the after a month's consumption the level of systemic 5-HIAA which is 5-hydroxy indole acetic acid which is the breakdown product of serotonin in the serum in the blood was much higher significantly higher um, 
obviously they couldn't trepan these people. They couldn't drill holes in their heads to, te to test whether their brain serotonin was higher. So they measured it in the blood. They found that the serotonin had trended upwards in the blood, but the 5-HIA was much higher, which I think is more significant because if your serotonin in your, in your outside the central nervous system is high, then you might have significant problems like with digestion and stuff, you know, because serotonin receptors in the gut can often upset the digestion. So um, ginger, for example, I think blocks some of the serotonin receptors in the stomach, which is why it has an anti nauseant effect. But anyway, so, so uh, there's also evidence from the pharmacological end that cacao, some of the polyphenols in cacao are mild monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and they inhibit both monoamine oxidase A and B. So they're guaranteed to, at least to some degree, raise serotonin. Uh, and there's a few other chemicals in there that, that could do that. So that's the pharmacological thing. So I think it's craving a bit of a serotonin and other neurochemicals, happy chemicals fix. However, the yes but is that some researchers have found that these cravings are very strongly culturally determined. So that, for example, uh, while American women tended to crave chocolate during their period, Spanish women didn't. And so it's kind of like, oh, OK. Well, maybe, maybe it's because they live in Spain and it's sunnier and their background levels of serotonin are higher all the time. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's so many factors that could go into that. But there seems to be a very strong culturally determined level to it. But this, this could be down to the problem of um, conducting um, science in this way, where we look at one factor at a time. And of course, life isn't, as we are now preaching to the choir here, but it's polyfactorial, isn't it? It's very difficult to tease these things out. It's a useful exercise to try to do that. But um, the, 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 I talk about this in the book again, the placebo effect, which is actually what Daniel Merman, uh, who, if you, I'm hoping some of you have read his book, uh, Meaning Meds, I think it's Meaning Medicine and the Placebo Effect or something. Um, and he, t he, he wants it to be renamed the meaning effect because the meaning of any drug or substance or treatment profoundly affects the effects of that treatment. It profoundly affects what, what actual real world pharmacological results accrue from that treatment. So um, the cultural meaning of a substance or thing or treatment or procedure actually affects its pharmacological outcomes. Um, so anyway. So with that, um sort of diving into the pharmacology could you share with us about you know i guess the um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors and how it's been used with the psychedelic side because i think some people may have <laughs> joined to learn about you know how how is cacao um you know can can be used in this sort of um context yeah. Well, it, it still is, actually. I mean, there are, apart from the cacao ceremonies, where it's used in its own right, obviously, um, it, it was also, it was used historically with the mushrooms. Um, so we don't know whether they mixed the mushrooms in or whether they had them alongside. Um, but we know from historical accounts um, that and these were accounts given to Spanish chroniclers just after the conquest, because there are a few like um, a Bernardino de Sahagún and these, these other chroniclers like Francisco Hernández de Toledo, who went over to Mexico and chronicled, took, took early ethnobotanical and uh, anthropological accounts. Um, and we know that they used it with the mushrooms in ceremonies. They drank the chocolate and they ate the mushrooms. Um, so that's sort of... Um, tier two evidence that they may that it doesn't suggest that there is a connection we just know that they have them at the same time um and then there's the modern cacao ceremonies which are a sort of fairly new phenomenon really uh, derived from mainly i think keith wilson this uh, american self-styled cacao shaman very interesting guy uh, who, who sort of developed them in the late 90s i think and early 2000s and then the other sort of uh what was i going to talk about the historic I can't remember, my, my brain's just gone blank. Um, you asked me about the cacao yeah. and psilocybin mushrooms and how they work, right? Okay, sorry, back on track. Um, the short answer is we don't know, but we have some hypotheses. Um, I was really startled to find that there's been no advance on Jonathan Ott's work in the late 90s, early 2000s, when he talked about we know that monoamine oxidase inhibitors, these substances which inhibit monoamine oxidase, the enzymes that break down 
a lot of these um, uh, uh, the monoamines like serotonin, dopamine, phenethylamine, and all of that. Uh, we know that those inhibitors potentiate some psychotropic substances, but don't potentiate them all. So, for example, monoamine oxidase inhibitors do potentiate um, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which is found uh, endogenously in the human body in the spinal cord, but also found in some Amazonian plants like uh, virola and anadenanthera, um, and that they go into ayahuasca. So ayahuasca, of course, some of you will know this, many of you will know this, uh, contains plants which contain DMT, high levels of DMT, and high levels of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, so Banisteriopsis carpi being one of the plants that's used for that purpose. So if you inhibit monoamine oxidases, it increases the level of DMT. So that's one, one tryptamine, as it's called, one psychoactive so-called hallucinogenic substance. I hate that word because it's not accurate. But um, hallucinogenic uh, substances, which which are potentiated by monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but others aren't. I don't think, for exa example, LSD, uh, the synthetic lysergic acid dimethylamide, which is structurally very similar but more potent to LSA, lysergic acid amide, that originates from morning glory seeds or the seeds of Hawaiian baby woodrose, whatever. I don't think that is potentiated at all by monoamine oxidase inhibitors. But I think with cacao, what you have, as I'm one of my, 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 my I have two pharmacological hypotheses about cacao. One is that it is what I call a hedonic modifier, and the other is an antiphobic substance. So it reduces conditioned fear a little bit, I think. Uh, and I think that for a variety of reasons that I go into in the book, but it also, it also goes in, it also modifies pleasure responses and I don't think it does that, that in a very simple or direct way but it contains lots of substances at very low levels that affect things so in terms of psilocybin it's definitely got low level monoamine oxidase inhibitor activity and it's thought that MAOIs probably potentiate mushrooms we do know that ah, that's what went out of my head earlier I knew there was something else I wanted to mention we do know that it is used nowadays to actually potentiate mushrooms. There are anecdotal reports of people doing this, of taking cacao with mushrooms. A good friend of mine went to Spain literally two weeks ago to, to do a mushroom retreat and the woman was brewing up cacao and giving it out. And he said, as soon as he, he drank the cacao and 20 minutes later, he was like, wow, it just my head blew up basically. And he said, he said I didn't know chocolate could be so strong. And I was like, well, yes. Uh, so it, we, we, it's, it's likely that the MRIs, the, the, the polyphenols mainly do potentiate in that way. But then there are a small amounts of trace amines in cacao. So tiny amounts of, of serotonin, much larger amounts of, um, uh, dopamine, significant amounts of, I think, the precursor phenylalanine, which is used to make dopamine, um, and a uh, fair small amount of phen phenethylamine, but then it, it, cacao also contains this substance, um, trigonelline, which you find small amounts of it in coffee, you find small amounts of it in fenugreek, but trigonelline actually binds to phenethylamine and ferries it into the central nervous system so that it doesn't get broken down by monoamine oxidases in the gut. So you have this very, so the reason that's important is because these trace amines alone activate these what are now known as this fairly newish research well maybe 15 years old now but it's still new uh, trace amine associated receptors which are found in in the limbic system and in the lining of the nose really interestingly for all aromatherapists out there but um they um they seem to accel when they're activated they accelerate the sort of pleasure system in the brain they they they, they make it turn over a bit more quickly so it's kind of like oiling that engine so i think there's there's that probably plays a role plus of course as i've said cacao is a really strong vasodilator so if you're taking it with another substance it's going to deliver more of that substance to the brain because you're going to get vasodilation in the brain so it's got and then of course there's the, the, there's this trace amount of anandamide the endogenous cannabinoid which is found in chocolate and these other substances this um, linoleol ethanolamine and NO linoleol ethanolamine that you find in cacao, very tiny amounts of these things, but 
those two substances retard the breakdown of anandamide. So we don't know to what extent each of those substances has an effect. And, and some scientists have written off the anandamide and the phenethylamine in cacao saying, oh, the dosage is too low. But when you look at the suite of all the constituents in cacao, I think it's extremely likely that they have a synergistic effect. Um, and when you then look at, as I've gone into this in the book in detail, all of the social research on chocolate, it's absolutely fascinating. Like the fact that they gave it to you know, pregnant women who eat chocolate, women who eat chocolate during their pregnancy. This is research from the University of Helsinki, not sponsored by any chocolate company, by the way. So that's important. Um, they found that uh, women who ate chocolate during their pregnancy rated their children three months after birth, their infants, as being happier. Um, and the women who are stressed during pregnancy, um, normally those women who are stressed had rated their children's behavior at three months as being worse, but the ones who'd eaten chocolate didn't. It seemed to have this preventive effect, which raises many questions. Is it because the women who are chocoholics were, had the personality to you know, see their children differently? They were, they were more optimistic? Is it because the chocolate affected the women's perception, you know, or did the chocolate affect the personalities of the babies from within the womb? I mean, it's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of research like this, like a bunch of uh, old people socializing more, the people who eat the most chocolate socialize more. And anyway, I could go on, but yeah. <laughs> so we've got, we've got five minutes left. So I'll see if anyone has any other quick questions. And um, I think it'd be really helpful. So in terms of people that, uh, you know, want to work more with chocolate would you yeah. recommend the sort of willies um cacao thing how would you um yes. recommend people get started basically yes great okay so the the willies cacao is great because you can just grate that and that's like uh you can you can choose your dosage you can say great a tablespoon or two tablespoons or whatever um i'd obviously suggest sticking your finger in the pot buy some and try it yourself <laughs> Do you know what I mean? um and and then and people can make a herbal tea like i say brew a, a herbal tea formula uh and then use that as the as the hot water to make the chocolate with so uh and that's a really good way of getting the dose in um something that's more accessible because obviously we know that many patients will not do that because they don't have time or that you know there are patients who as we know won't even take a tincture because it's like they don't like the taste or whatever so dark chocolate is is fine for for a daily dose so uh, um oh, and by the way in the back of the book there's an enormous 50 page monograph on cacao and i finish up with some uh suggestions on all the different ways it could be used um and and some dosage suggestions which i think in retrospect if this book runs to a second edition my dosages are rather on the high side i'd probably lower them i'm probably reflecting my own bias a bit there to be honest um because it needs it doesn't need as much as i suggest in the book really um so dark chocolate at something depending what you're using for so let's say somebody you're just wanting to use it to uh reduce their risk of heart attack and stroke um, and uh, and to reduce their risk of type 2 diabetes, which is uh, astounding. The chocolate, which 85% cacao is a uh, chocolate, ordinary dark eating chocolate is 15% sugar. Uh, all, the sh all the data shows it reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes. So it's like the cacao totally offsets it. So yeah. ordinary dark eating chocolate is fine. Cocoa powder is my third option, but it's the least good option because it's the most processed. So it has... Um, it's the most oxidized. Um, th there's also raw cacao powder, but the only issue I have with that is raw cacao powder will have more of the antioxidants and more of the polyphenols in, is that because it's been mostly defatted, um, like cocoa powder, once the packet is opened, those polyphenols are going to be exposed to the air. So they're, they're gonna start to oxidize a little bit. Um, okay, so we've just had three questions come. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll try and keep it to like um, a minute. Right. Each. Um, I think actually be really helpful if you share with people about your book and what it goes into. Gillian has asked okay. to also discuss the psycho spirit psycho spiritual effects yes. of chocolate in your book. Yes. 
So the book is divided into three sections. It's, it's the first section is a bit about the history. It's called The Potted History of Chocolate. So I focus mainly on the pre-Columbian history. And then I do a sort of whistle stop through the post-Columbian history because lots of other books do that and they do that very well. So I wanted to focus mainly on that. And then the second chapter in that section talks about all the different drinks that were made from cacao historically and all the different formulations and yada, yada, yada. Then the middle section of the book, which is the biggest section, is the chocolate apothecary section. So that talks about the indigenous medicinal uses of it, then the pharmacology and the constituents and all the science of it. And then it's sort of got two whole chapters called Chocolate, Love and Bondage about its use, its traditional reputation as an aphrodisiac, its um, potential effects on culture and on uh, behaviour and it's, it's, it's sort of association with eating disorders, which it, it doesn't quite have a causative effect, but obviously being a fatty food, it's often linked to that kind of thing. And I'm a former binge eater, which I found really interesting. I talk about that in the book. So uh, it's like, I love chocolate. So it's like, mm, okay. So I had to, I had to sort of go into that. Um, but I think it's quite helpful for, for potential recovery. But anyway, and then that section of the book is all about the pharmacology and the behavioural effects, and it explains all that. And that section also contains a formulary with recipes. And when I say recipes, I mean for traditional chocolate drinks. So it's all the modern recipes in Mexico that are made with cacao using indigenous ingredients. And I've done my best to reconstruct the ancient pre-Columbian drinks. Some we can reconstruct directly because we've got old manuscripts which give the actual recipes. And some I've reconstructed just from 14 years of research and three trips to Mexico and Guatemala where I've interviewed 27 different people and, and tried to put them together using the original ingredients as best I can. And then the last section of the book is the metaphysical chocolate section. And that's where I talk about its use in indigenous religion, all the different beliefs associated with cacao in, in Mesoamerica, and how that transformed when it came to Europe and what some of the overlaps are. And then there's a massive appendix where there's a huge uh, monograph on cacao there's a, a bit about with all the not all the interviews just five of the interviews I did some really interesting some of the really interesting ones like with the shaman and uh, a few other ones and then uh, there's also I think 19 different mini monographs I've done on some of the plants associated with cacao so like um, uh, obvious ones like chili and vanilla but then we've got allspice um, and various really interesting Mesoamerican plants uh, like uh, the Isthmus jasmine, um, uh, magnolia, uh, rosita de cacao, loads of indigenous plants. So that's I'm, just, I'm just conscious and some people might need to jump off. So if anyone okay. does need to jump off, I think we just need to let everyone know because we've already had great reviews from Dea talking about how incredible the book is, that there is a discount code um, which is chalk if you want to buy it. Um, so, um, chalk, 20, <laughs> chalk 20 to give 20% off. Yes, and that, that code works, Izzy, on the, um, it's on the uh, Eon Books website. So you, it's, it's available on Amazon at the moment, but that discount code is only viable on the Eon website. So if you go to the eonbooks.co.uk, my book's on there, and it's, um, it's CHOC20 at checkout. It will give you 20% off. And apparently that code, it was supposed to end on 31st of October, but I'm going to ask Ollie if he can extend it because I'm like, you know, I we've only just got... <laughs> Yeah, on the email, they, they've extended it to November. So, ah, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Um, but if you do, do you have a few more minutes? Because we just had a few more questions. Yeah. If that's oh, okay, no thank, thank you for your time. Um, <laughs> so another question um, was just quickly about contraindications for people taking SSRIs, yes. antidepressants, St. John's Wort, and also contraindications for um, di diabetes medication. Is that... Oh. Anything okay. with uh, Yeah, I've got a few thoughts there. Uh, St. John's Wort, no, don't worry about it. If it's on St. John's, it's not a problem at all. Um, if you're on SSRIs, I'd be a little bit more cautious. Um, we don't know. I doubt it would be contraindicated, but if you're taking it in larger doses, like in ceremonial doses, then maybe. So I would urge anyone who's on SSRIs, you could, you're probably all right with the low maintenance doses, like five to 10 grams a day preventive. But if you're going to do larger cacao ceremony doses, like I take 45 grams three times a week, just as my breakfast chocolate, which is apparently a ceremonial dose. I'm like, okay. So if I was on SSRIs, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. 
Um, diabetes medication, you're fine. I mean, it's gonna, it may slightly reduce the blood sugar, but it would do so gradually and over time. Its effects on blood sugar and on blood pressure, of, um, blood pressure is super modest, like an actual blood pressure, it's like one milligram of mercury. <laughs> Who's going to notice that? But the, on blood sugar, it might be a little more profound, but it's going to be slow. So, uh, I mean, unless you're on the cusp of hypoglycemia already, uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much with that. In terms of other contraindications, so those are medical contraindications. Um, again, these are all listed in the monograph. The big one I forgot in the book, I probably forgot this because one of my character flaws is that I sometimes make things really complicated because I enjoy it and I forget the really obvious stuff and it was like the uh, the contraindication that I forgot to include was heartburn because chocolate can aggravate heartburn reflux for some people so that's that's an obvious one if somebody has GERD they might want to not have too much um, too much chocolate or cacao um, other than that um, there aren't too many. There, there, there were there were a few, but I, I, I list them in the book. Um, if I can, I can get it up next. If you read me up the next, read me out the next question, Izzy, while I'm looking this up. Yeah. Next question is, where can we source good cacao seeds if we wanted to grow our own? Well, I did spot that question. I thought that's an interesting one. I did put, I have put a link to a place where you can buy cacao. I mean, a, a, an address in the book. So, uh, um, an organization called Enaco in, in South Mexico, in Chiapas, where some of the best cacao in the world is grown. The issue with growing it is it's this tropical plant and it's hella tricky to grow even when you are in the tropics. Um, it takes a lot of um, knowledge to grow cacao tree and it's typically grown in cacao tales or cacao orchards um, with, uh, it's, it, it, anyway, that you can get seeds from these organizations. Uh, there's the umbrella organization in cacao um, yeah, exactly. Day, exactly that. Um, it's 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 it needs. It, you can't grow it in the UK unless you have a greenhouse heated to exactly the right cacao. If the temperature dips below eighteen degrees Celsius, it will die. It needs bet between eighteen and something like thirty. It's eighteen plus <laughs> essentially, and very high humidity. So, and, and it's an understory tree, so it needs shade. It needs just the right amount of shade and sunlight. Um, and it's a very delicate tree. Now, the, the, the more robust varieties of chocolate, the Forestero cultivars from South America originally, uh, they, they are slightly easier to cultivate and higher yielding, but they're not as good. Um, so the, the, the indigenous Mexican and Central American Criollo cacao cultivars are, are much more of a, I refer to them in a book as a bit of a geisha, really. You know, it's like it's the, the sort of the plant that cultivated the humans as much as we cultivated it. And it needs proper, respectful treatment. <laughs> um, so, but you, I mean, it's been an ambition of mine if I could construct a, some sort of terrarium eventually uh, heated with just enough shade and light and really carefully control it. But um, I am, I'm a top down herbalist. I learned my herbalism from books and then from practice and finally from plants. I had a brown thumb, which is slowly turning green. So I can just about keep English plants alive. I'll, I'll, I'll give it another few years before I can grow a mad tropical one. Uh, but yeah. So, um, and then um, Fee, um, she just had a question about cacao as a tincture as a tincture and that's yeah. an interesting one avicenna do do a cacao tincture don't they which is very lovely um <laughs> very nice i ain't gonna diss it it's particularly nice i don't know if, if any of you had it with um uh like a rose and chocolate shop i think hanania um at middlesex used to do this uh for students when we were bored during classes if everyone was flagging occasionally she used to get some uh, rose syrup and some theobroma tincture and um uh, just half and half and give that to people as a shot, which I always used to spike with a couple of drops of chili because it just, uh, it's brilliant. That that picked everyone up. But it's it's not super strong as a tincture. It's perfectly fine, but the dose required for real medicinal effects, even for prevention, is probably higher than you could comfortably achieve with a one in three tincture, you know, which is the maximum concentration you can achieve with just steeping. Plus you're losing a lot of the fat soluble constituents in, in, the, in the seed. So I really strongly recommend 
using the whole seed, you know, in the traditional way. So in drinks, you know, grinding it, mixing with hot water. Um, oh, thank you, Daya. Okay, I used a paste to make tinctures, cacao paste is under braised, and mezcal as the base. All right, interesting. Well, do you use the whole seed in the preparations, Daya? Do you know what I mean? Or do you filter it? You can you switch your mic on, it's fine. It's like we're in the question and answer bit. You don't have to. No. <laughs> Uh, oh my god i'm so excited to be in this talk thank you, thank you. Um, so i'll use i'll use cacao i'll use that paste which is the beans fermented sun dried and then lightly roasted at less than 70 degrees celsius right and so for nice. the i'll just chop up the paste and then mix that with the mezcal and the shisandra berries and then and then filter it afterwards so um no okay that's what I was going for. So you actually include, do, do you ingest the powdered herbs as you ingest the beverage? So it's a thick kind of beverage. Yeah, so I blend it all and yes. it doesn't quite work as a tincture. It's more like it's quite thick. Yes, yeah, yeah, perfect. That's what I mean. It's, it's, you're using the whole bean. So mm -hmm. I think with cacao, you really need to do that because it's got a lot in the fatty constituents. And for the midis, thank you, Daya, that's brilliant. So you're using the, uh, thank you. Um, so you're using, you're using the whole thing. But just because... Um, I mean, the tincture's good. It can absolutely be tinctured. I don't want to put anyone off it, but for medicinal effects, I, I recommend using the whole thing, incorporating it. Great. Great. Um, <laughs> so I think it's 10 past eight. Um, so perhaps if we end there, because it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. So I think, Marcus, if you just uh, quickly take us through the book again, because you know right, yes, everyone's going to be super right. interested. I've got my copy here, which you probably can't see because of my crappy lighting. But anyway, that is that is the book. Um, so it's it's a bit of it's a bit of a slab. It has got fourteen years of work in it, so um, that's why it's massive. Um, so it's 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 not a cheap book. I'm sorry to say, but it is hopefully a, a useful reference book because um, it's got the the, the reedy bit at the front. And then uh, the monographs, the monographs at the back. So uh, there's there's a there's a lot in it. Um, what was I going to say about that? There is an e-book version as well, which obviously will be lower price. There's a Kindle version, um, and I'm currently recording at glacial pace an audio book version because I've only got one morning a week when I can do it, and usually the builders next door start doing stuff, and you know I have to repress the urge to go out and kill them all so um so anyway that is happening at some point um but i would if you're going to get it for reference I'd, I'd suggest obviously get the physical book just because um i mean whatever whatever you like because uh the ebooks the, the ebooks e good as well but i personally because it's got the the monographs and stuff in it i anyway we'll see um, <laughs> so that's and um, Julian's asked as well, how can we get hold of you um, if we want to learn more, work with you, etc.? Right, okay. <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's, that. thank you, Julian. Um, well, there's my website, which is um, nocturnalherbalist.com. Um, I do that because I'm, I'm also, my, my, I'm half, half science-y person and half a hippie, um, so I do astrology as well. I love that. Um, so I've got, uh, so that's my nocturnal herbalist. Um, so and you, there's a contact on there there's um they, oh yeah and my youtube channel a uh, little baby youtube channel is uh nocturnal herbalist on youtube so i'm i'm gradually filling that up with any thing that interests me <laughs> <laughs> amazing well thank you so much for your time this has been fascinating and you know i'd love to do more of these i'm sure everyone would um and it's lovely to hear from dea sharing her reviews from the book so it's lovely. really exciting and um just quickly if anyone who is on the zoom call who's not um familiar with the association of master herbalists we do do events so if you want to um find out what we're up to you can follow us on facebook at association of master herbalists instagram at am herbalist or just get in touch via the website which is www.associationofmasterherbalist.co.uk <laughs> so um thank you all so much for your time apologies for running over and marcos it's just been such a pleasure to thank you, hear from you. Thank, you. thank you everyone for coming uh, i really enjoyed it thank you thank you <laughs> take care everyone bye